thousands of people on the common yesterday so I guess it was uh, pretty busy up there but it's great that we could get together this morning and you're very very welcome as you can see the uh, the table's set fair ready for <coughs> us to share communion together a little bit later in the service and I just want to begin our service today by <coughs> reading a couple of verses from Isaiah so just bear with me while I turn up my scriptures this is from Isaiah 53. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed we all like sheep have gone astray each one of us has turned to our own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all well a little later this morning we are going to be sharing the, the bread and the wine together 
And I thought just as a preparation to that uh, prayer from way back in the 16th century. O oh Lord, teach us to know that grace proceeds, accompanies and follows our salvation, that it sustains the redeemed soul, that not one link of its chain can ever break. From Calvary's cross, wave upon wave of grace reaches us, deals with our sin, washes us clean, renews our hearts, strengthens our will, draws out our affection, and kindles the flame in our souls, rules throughout our inner man, consecrates our every thought, word and work, teaches us thy immeasurable love. How great are our privileges in Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to sing a fantastic hymn to begin with this morning. Words will be on the screen. These are the days of Elijah. And these are the 
Pleasure, brother. Thank you. Loving Father, we want to thank you and praise you for these gifts that have been given as a token of our love for you. Lord, may you use them greatly and multiply these gifts, Lord, to use for your greater glory in this part of Linfield. <coughs> Father, we praise you today for these gifts. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to ask Eileen to come and read to us now. So, uh, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 5, and Eileen's going to read from verse 12 through to the first part of 21. Acts 5, beginning at verse 12. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. All the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. Thank you, Ivy. If you'd like to keep that passage open, we'll uh, have a look at what that's got to say to us right now. I was sharing with uh, Stuart uh, before we came through this morning. Yesterday, Ali and I were in Worthing, and uh, we see there that uh, what Eileen read about uh, the apostles being told to go and stand in the temple courts. Well, it certainly wasn't the temple courts, it was the middle of Worthing, but there was a young woman yesterday and she had a Bible with her and she was proclaiming the word of God and I thought, this is wonderful, it really is, it's absolutely wonderful to hear somebody uh, taking the time to share in the, the wonderful word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I, my heart went out to it, it really did. Now for some reason, my iPad doesn't want to open this way. I don't know what's going on here. Ah, oh, that's better. That's got it. Well, if you were here last Sunday morning, you might remember we celebrated the birthday of the church. There's a big clue here with a happy birthday at the top there. And we thought about what happened on the day when the Holy Spirit came in power on the disciples, when Jews from all over the known world, they heard the wonders of God being proclaimed in their own language and if you remember Carmen who's that way sunning herself on holiday at the moment she read out a whole list of different places where these folks had come from and I'm not going to read them all through again but they're there in in Acts 2 if you want to read them then if you remember we saw Peter who stood up and he addressed the crowd and he brought the people the gospel that's what he brought and the outcome well, we know it was 3,000 came to know the Lord Jesus Christ on that day. <laughs> well, you might be sitting here this morning thinking, that's wonderful. But, you know, I could never stand up and say what Peter said. I probably couldn't do what that young girl was doing yesterday in Worthing. <coughs> but before we dismiss that entirely, let me just ask you this question. Did Peter stand up and speak before the Holy Spirit came on him? Or after the Spirit came on him and the rest of the disciples. 
Well, we know, don't we? He didn't. He waited till the Spirit came on him. It was only through the power of the Holy Spirit did people hear the wonders of God. And they heard them in their own language. And it was only through the witness of the Holy Spirit did Peter's sermon convict 3,000 people of their sins that day. And this is a really important truth that I think as the church we need to get hold of ourselves today. Because there's always this propensity for churches to say, oh, let's have an initiative, let's have a sweep round the area, let's have an evangelistic push, and perhaps we'll get a, a, a really renowned evangelist, somebody like John Goodway, come and, and preach. But then we only to discover later, after the events, that all the efforts of the church, the sending out of the invitations, special prayer times, all the resources that get spent uh, on, a, on a, a, a mission, and all the other things, it seemed to have yielded a really meagre harvest. We have a celebration service on a Sunday and we get disappointed that not so many people have come. And you know yourself, because we've been there, haven't we? You get discouraged, you feel as though you've failed. And then we make all manner of excuses, don't we? Oh, we didn't pray enough. Well, that might be true, of course. But the hearts of the people in our neighbourhood, well, they're so hard. We couldn't get through to them. They're not interested. Well, when we go back to the day of Pentecost, I can't believe that the same wouldn't have been true of all who were in Jerusalem that day. I know they were Jews, they'd come to worship God. But they heard something new, something absolutely incredible. But amid the many thousands who did hear what the apostles proclaimed, 3,000 heard. 3,000 believed, 3,000 came to faith. You see, it's not enough for us to think that we can just say, well, Jesus is Lord, thinking that people will know, they know who Jesus is, they know he's Lord. That's not enough, is it? They need to know who they're responding to and they need to know why they need to respond. Well, if you can, just flick back in your Bibles to Acts chapter 1 and look at verse 8. <coughs> Acts 1 verse 8 Okay, Jesus says this But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem And in all Judea and Samaria And to the ends of the earth So you see, if we believe by faith That God raised Jesus from the dead and we've submitted ourselves to him and become born again, then we will have received the Holy Spirit. And although we weren't around 2,000 years ago, what God says to us through his words makes us witnesses of what he's done because of his great love for us. Because we believe by faith he came among us in order to satisfy God's wrath at our sinfulness. And being a just God, he took the punishment we deserve on himself for sinning against us. And we know he did that by laying down his life for us on the cross. And we also know this, that death had no power over him because God raised him to life on the third day, which means he's alive today. He's alive, living by his spirit in all who know and love him. And if that's you, that means you're here today. All you who have submitted your hearts and lives to him and are now determined to live in obedience to him, to his will, to his word. However challenging that is in this sinful world that we live in. See, as Christians, we're to walk on that narrow pathway that leads us to life, not the big, broad M25 motorway. So as we come again this morning to God's word and we marvel at the wonderful things that we read of in these early chapters of Acts, and I've often thought, and I know others have thought as well, that really, it shouldn't really be called the Acts of the Apostles, it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit mm. at work through the Apostles. But I pray today as we look at God's word that we won't just see these events back then as a, a kind of a history lesson of times gone by, but we will rejoice that God's Spirit is very much at work today, even amid all the opposition to Christ that we see around us. 
Well, a number of us were here last Sunday evening, but uh, if you weren't, then John brought a great word from Acts 4. Uh, and what had happened, it was after Peter and John had healed a crippled beggar in the name of Jesus of mm -hmm. Nazareth. And if you know the story, you'll know that Peter and John had been thrown into prison as a result of this. And for us as human beings, we think, oh, that's awful, isn't it? Isn't that terrible? It seems like a defeat. These guys have been silenced. They've been thrown into prison. Especially when all they've done is shown an act of kindness, an act of love, that the love of Almighty God to a, a lame beggar who for 40 years, can you imagine it, for 40 years, these religious in Jerusalem, because he sat in the same place by the sound of his all the time, they would have walked past him all aloof and said, oh, rubbish, sinner, terrible. Because that would have been the attitude back then mm. to somebody like this man. And yet, here's Peter and John reaching out with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ and healing that, this man. You see, the problem with legalistic religion is it forgets God's grace and it forgets his mercy. It forgets we're to show acts of love and to care for our fellow human beings. The Bible's full of challenges. It was challenges back in the Old Testament for the people back then. I was thinking Isaiah 58, I think it's verse 7, and you know, Isaiah says to, the, to God's people, you know, the Lord requires today that you serve the Lord, that you worship the Lord by firstly feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, uh, giving the poor wanderer shelter and not turning it back on your own flesh and blood. And then a verse that really speaks into my heart, which comes from Micah, again in the Old Testament. These guys would have known these verses. What does the Lord require of you? Act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. And so through the power of the Holy Spirit going before them, Peter and John, they demonstrated God's love and they healed this man which was plain for everyone to see. They couldn't, the religious leaders couldn't do a, a cover-up job on it because the guy was right there. He was praising God, just like Ray might have even been doing a little jig around the temple. But of course, when something wonderful happens like this, there's always a backlash. There's a backlash from non-believers, from the religious. Well, times don't change much, do they? Because until God brings about a change in someone's life, they remain blind to their sinful state before God. And because many are spiritually blind through being ignorant of the scriptures, they carry on living depraved, sinful lives. And for some, they will even twist God's word, suggesting that his desire to protect us from evil and to care for us is judgmental it's even unloving so what happens today liberal minded people they exert pressure in different areas of society they get politicians to pass laws that they know will shut many christians up with the threat that you know you'll lose your job or even worse you'll get thrown into prison your livelihood will be gone your reputation in tatters and you know there's liberal organisations today such as Stonewall who over the years they've been allowed into our schools. This was the main thrust of this young girl's message yesterday that we're not being fair on our children anymore because Stonewall flood children's minds with what goes against the scriptures just to satisfy their own evil lusts and desires. And of course what happens then when a teacher dares to speak out to protect the children in their care, then in this woke generation, then we know what the outcome's going to be. They'll be subject to misconduct, to grossly unfair, untrue name calling. You're a bigot. You're homophobic. You're trans haters. All of these things, we hear them, don't we, daily? <coughs> and you know, this week, 
you know, I'm not a huge lover of bishops, and I don't, I don't suppose they like me that much, but Bishop of Manchester, he was talking about parades, and I thought, oh, he's going to talk about who's going to be parading this morning in Manchester. Will it be the red side or the blue side? It's the blue side, thank goodness. <laughs> and, you know, he was talking about parades. Guess what was top of his list of parades that he loves? Pride. Here we go, another one. Oh. Heart newspaper this week, if you've got want to get a copy, then out in the hall. The Church of England are promoting a transgender book. It's been sanctioned by the church, it's been distributed through the Church of England, and it's aimed at four-year-olds to talk about you can be whatever gender you choose to be. Four years old. What are we doing to our children, folks? What are we doing to them? So we need to pray, don't we, that the Holy Spirit will go before each of these poor young souls who have to listen to these things and the teachers who have to teach them because all they want to do is protect the children in their care and to protect them properly. And of course, when these things do come to court, then we really need to be praying that the Holy Spirit will go before the defending lawyers and put words into, into their mouths that will silence all the evilness that's being thrown at those that they're defending. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, don't worry what to say. The Holy Spirit will tell you, will give you the words to say. Well, I mentioned last week, <coughs> excuse me, that for us to enter glory, we need to be clean on the inside and just a week or so ago, we looked at the preceding verses to what Eileen read today of this couple, Ananias and Sapphira, who, although they seem to be the, the real deal as believers, it was quite clear, wasn't it, when Peter accused them of lying to the Holy Spirit, that their faith was a sham. It was an act that didn't fool God. And for us today, to see God's judgment carried out as it was, well, that should challenge each one of us today to test and examine our own ways before God and, if necessary, repent before him. And we need to do that today, especially if we're coming to the table later. So, what we've seen so far in Acts is Satan's attempts to destroy the church from within. And, and that had failed, hadn't it? So, he resorts to another tactic now. He tries to shut up all the apostles by having them all thrown in prison. You know, Peter's already challenged the religious <laughs> leaders back in chapter 4 when they threatened he and John by saying to the religious, tell me what's right in God's eyes. What is right in God's eyes? Is it to listen to you or to God? You be the judges. As for us, we can't help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Well, as spirit-filled men and women, we need to pray for those who threaten us today. Pray that God, by his grace and mercy, will open our eyes to see the things that we've witnessed ourselves, the things we've read about in the scriptures, God's divine word of truth, and all the wonderful things that God is doing in people's lives today. Unfortunately, you're not going to hear them on the BBC or the ITV. You just won't. But God is at work, just as he was back in the day. Just always me at verses 12 to 14. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people, and all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Well, after that incident with Ananias and Sapphira, you can imagine that there was a lot of people would just get swept along in the euphoria of the, of the, of the joy of, of, of the genuine uh, believers. And I think this is probably what happened to Ananias and Sapphira. They got swept along in the joy. And we read there in verse 13, there was a lot of people who didn't dare join the believers. And that's probably because they knew in their hearts 
that they had not experienced a true work of God in their lives. That work of God that was absolutely evident in those who were really on fire for God. Even though these folks highly regarded the apostles, thought that it was absolutely brilliant that people were being healed, but without God's transformative work in them, being prepared to repent before the Lord, to submit their lives to him, well, that was just too much. So they just remained aloof from the believers. And you know, I have to say, I've met many church goers today that that sadly would be true of. <coughs> Going to church is one thing, but making a personal commitment to surrender their lives to God, well, for some, that's just taking religion a little bit too far. But, that said, verse 14, the church continued to grow. As a result, verses 15 and 16, people brought the sick friends and relatives into the streets so that Peter's shadow might fall on them when they passed by. Well, I'm sure many might think that this is bordering on superstition. But that said, just go back into the Gospels to the account of a woman who for years and years and years had suffered a, a repeated issue of blood. What did she do? She reached out and she touched the hem of Jesus' coat, his cloak. Was she healed? Yes. yes, she jolly well was, wasn't she? Praise the Lord she was. Well, if we think about the events of Pentecost, we often think that Pentecost turned the whole world upside down, and it did, of course. But the spirit at Pentecost, working through Peter and John and the rest of the disciples, is the chief witness of all that Jesus did. And his spirit continues to go before all who do the Lord's bidding today. So that Pentecostal sort of way is still at work today. So just a, a quick recap there before we move on to the next bit. The devils tried threatening Peter and John. Then when that didn't work, he had to go from within the church through Ananias and Sapphira, trying to damage the integrity of the church to reflect Christ's holiness, his purity. And of course we know that didn't work. So he comes up with plan C. C being for confident that this would work. It'll bring an end to all that God's trying to do. It, it won't fail. Look at verses 17 and 18. Then the high priest and all his associates who were members of the party of the Sadducees were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in public jail. But during the night, but during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. <coughs> well, I have to say, John tried to tell a joke last Sunday night and it fell as flat as a pancake. And it was all around the Sadducees. It's, have you ever wondered why they're called Sadducees? <laughs> what don't they believe in? Uh, resurrection. They don't believe in the resurrection. So that makes them really sad, doesn't it? So that's why they're sad, you see. Oh, don't worry. Don't worry. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, right? <laughs> there we are. Well, the devil might have thought just as he did when Jesus died on the cross that he'd won the victory, but of course we know he, that quickly evaporated because Jesus rose again on the third day. And he must have thought that having all the apostles locked up together in prison, well, that's going to stop the advance of the church, isn't it? But what did Jesus assure Peter would happen back in the Gospels? He said, Peter, the gates of Hades will not overcome the church. Nothing will overcome the church. And we need to remember as Christians living as we are in a world where Satan's doing everything he can to destroy God's plan for this world, which may well include, and I, I hate to say this, but it may well include each of us facing some form of persecution ourselves. Certainly we're going to face the ridicule of those around us, those who think we're absolutely balmy to believe what we do, who want to 
Why would we want to spend our time on a glorious Sunday morning in a church when we could be out there enjoying ourselves? Well, I'm sure we've all got friends and families who would say things like that to us. I know I have. But although the devil's active and he's a force for evil in the world today, one who as Christians we should be mindful of, we're to set our hearts and minds on the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who overcame all the powers of evil in his body, broken for us on the cross. Satan knows he's a defeated force and that makes him dangerous because he's like a wounded, cornered animal and he's dangerous. Why else would the Apostle Peter, who like all the other apostles knew persecution firsthand, why would he remind us to be alert? He said, because our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Well, lastly, just look with me at verses 19 to 21, that first part of 21. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go, stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, as they'd been told, and began to teach the people. Well, I mentioned earlier that the Holy Spirit is the chief witness of all that Jesus taught, said and did. And as believers, we're secondary witnesses to that, aren't we? Under the prompting of the Holy Spirit, we're told here, verse 19, that the angel of the Lord, he appeared, he opened the door of the jail and he brought them out. Not so that they could go home and have a hearty breakfast, but in order that they should go and that they should stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. This new life, this new life that's only ours because of the sacrifice Jesus was prepared to make of himself on the cross for each one of us. When we, as undeserving as we are, receive God's amazing grace and mercy. Because it's only through Jesus' blood has God washed away all our sins something we shall be remembering in a few moments. So because of what Jesus has done for us, we no longer stand condemned before God, facing a future of eternal punishment. Rather, we have the promise of new life in Christ to live out now, today. And even when these bodies, these frail bodies of ours finally give out, we shall live on with Christ throughout eternity. This is such great news, isn't it? That we can see why Jesus commands us to go as his witnesses and make disciples of all the nations. It's really great news. And as we see throughout Acts, the Holy Spirit is the one who will convert people's hearts. Not us, it's the Holy Spirit. We are secondary witnesses and we're called to help people become disciples. That's what we're called to do, isn't it? Then who knows that we won't see even more acts of grace and mercy among us as we see in these great verses of the scriptures here. Amen. 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 Father, we want to thank you for your word to us this morning and we praise you, Lord God, for just a few verses of scripture, Lord, that seemingly don't say a lot, but they have an awful lot to say us to tell us, Lord. So thank you, Father, for your word today. In the great name of Jesus, we thank you. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again. I think I've missed a hymn out, so uh, let's move on to the next hymn before we come to prayer. Can you call up Behold the Lamb, Susan? Thank you.
today in uh, our readings is Psalm 95 and it says this come let us sing for joy to the Lord let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song for the Lord is the great God the great King above all gods in his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. 
Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Father, today we want to thank you that we can come and we can worship you in spirit and in truth, for you are indeed the rock of our salvation. And Lord, we want to come before you this morning in absolute thanksgiving. Father, with the table set for communion, and we just think with great thanksgiving, Lord, of the cross of Jesus, that you were prepared to go to Calvary for each one of us. Lord, thank you so much that you, we can extol you through our worship, through our singing, through the Psalms, and through our prayers. Lord, today we thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, there is no one other than you. There is no one like you. You are the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent God. And we thank you today, Lord God, for each of those descriptions of you. Father, the world's got many gods, we know that. And yet, Lord, none of them are deities. None of them are the true God. For we have but one God. And we thank you, Lord, today. One God, three in one, Father, Son and Spirit. Lord, today we praise you for the triune God. And we ask today, Lord God, that as we bring our prayers to you, that, Father, you will intercede on our behalf. Bring our prayers right into the very presence of Almighty God. Lord, we ask today that you would hear our prayers. We pray, Lord, for our world today. As I said a minute ago, this, this world has many gods with a small g. And yet, Lord, there are no gods because they can do nothing there other than what they are, which is idols, man-made worship. And Lord, we confess today that if there's anything in our lives that are, are causing man-made worship, that we would bring them before you today, Lord, and repent of them, confess our sins before you. So please help us to do that, Lord, before we come to communion today. May our hearts be right before you. And Father, as we think about this great psalm, the psalm of David, Lord. He's given his thanks to you, Lord, for being the rock of his salvation, and we can echo those same words. But then the mood changes halfway through the psalm by David saying, Today, if only you would hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Marabah, as you did that day at Massah in the wilderness. Father, we know that that goes back into the Old Testament where we know that your people, those who you brought out of captivity, Lord, you'd set free and you'd sent them towards uh, a new land, Lord. You'd brought them through the Red Sea. And Lord, all they could do is very similar to what happens today. Moan. Moan about what they didn't have. Moan as to why they were where they were. And Lord God, we pray today for all those who have hard hearts towards you. Lord, we would pray that you would soften those hard hearts, that you would bring them, Lord, into your presence, that they may see the wonder of Almighty God. Father, we want to thank you today that you are a God who loves us so incredibly, Lord. We know we don't deserve any of your love, love. But Father, we thank you today that you've demonstrated that to us very much so in Jesus' death on the cross. So we thank you today, Lord, for that. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Lord, I just pray this morning for our <coughs> world that we live in. And we think of that horrendous train crash in <coughs> India. Father, we don't know what the final death toll is, but Lord, we know it's in the hundreds. And Lord, as the powers of be look to see 
what it is that's, that's caused the problems. Lord, there could be a multitude of things. But Father, we would pray for those who are grieving and mourning today mm -hmm. the loss of a loved one. Yes. Father, we would pray that you'd bring a healing across India today. And Lord, we would ask that you would just help those involved in the rescue attempts, Lord. Even the pictures on the TV last night, some of the soldiers couldn't just bring themselves to look at the carnage that was there. So Father, we just pray that you would bring comfort, bring healing to those who are struggling today because of losing a loved one. For we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We pray for the two-year-old today, Lord, who was slaughtered in Ukraine as a result of the the, the uh, drone attacks. And Lord, I'm not going to stand here and say Ukraine are lily white in this because they're just as complicit in, in sending back uh, hardware. But Lord God, we would just pray that there'd be a resolution to this pointless war. Lord, I just can't ever see an end to it. And Father, we would just pray that maybe, Lord, through raising up somebody, a politician maybe, or, or somebody who could really speak into the heart of President Putin, Lord. Speak into his life, Lord, that he may come to know you and repent of what he's been doing. Lord, we would pray again then for a healing of Ukraine and for those in Russia, Lord God. Father, we think of those who've been in prison for standing up and, and speaking against the government. So Father, we just ask that you would just be in that nation, Lord, both nations, bringing comfort, Lord, bringing hope and bringing peace. For we pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, we pray a bit closer to home, Lord, and we think of Village Day yesterday, and I'm sure the organisers were thrilled that it was such a lovely day yesterday. Father, we think of all of those on the common, and Lord, how wonderful it would be if all of those on the common were to hear the word of Jesus Christ and bring their hearts to know you. Lord, we do pray for this village of Linfield. We thank you for our three churches, Lord, for all saints, for the URC, for ourselves here and we pray Lord as we get together next uh, next couple of weeks for a fraternal that Lord we might be able to uh, see ways forward in which we can work closer together to your greater glory in this village. Amen. Lord help us in that we pray in the great name of Jesus. Amen. 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 And Father we just want to lift a few people in our church today Lord just want to lift Joan to you today, Lord. I know she's struggling a bit at the moment with back pain, and there's nothing worse than that. And Lord, we pray for Peter, continuing, Lord, to uh, in his uh, recovery. And Lord, we pray for others as well. Pray for Thelma at the back, Lord, and mm -hmm. we ask that you'll bless her. And Lord, we pray for John and Carmen at this time, who are on holiday down in Devon, Lord, and we ask that you'll bless them. Lord, we pray for any in our fellowship today who are really struggling in body, soul or mind. Lord, may they know the wonderful, wonderful joy of knowing Jesus. Lord, will you bring a healing upon heart, soul and mind, we pray today in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, I'm going to invite Stuart if you come up and join me at the, the table as we come to share in the Lord's Supper. Thanks, hey, Stuart. Yeah, have a seat. God of all good, we thank you today for the means of grace. Teach us to see in them your loving purpose and the joy and strength of our souls. You have prepared for us a feast and though each one of us are unworthy to sit down as guests, 
we wholly rest on the merits of Jesus and hide ourselves beneath his righteousness. Father, today we want to thank you for the body and blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Father, we come to your table today knowing that we cannot come before you trusting in our own righteousness, but only because of your mercy and your grace. Father, we know that we're not worthy to eat up the crumbs under your table, but we rejoice today that unlike us, you never change. Your nature is always to have mercy. And we pray today as we eat this bread and we drink this wine together, that we will remember your precious body broken for us and your blood poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Father, may we continue to dwell in you and you in us. Amen. Amen. Well, the Apostle Paul, he wasn't with the original disciples in the upper room when Jesus inaugurated this supper. So he says this, for I receive from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we want to thank you for your body broken for us. And Lord, as we take this bread as a symbol of your body broken, Father, may we feed on, your, on you in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. Well, I would normally say wait till we've all been served, but uh, today Stuart's going to, to follow me around. So I think what we'll do, I'm going to ask Stuart if he will pray for the wine and then I'll head off and then you follow. Okay. Let's thank the Lord for his provision for the wine. Let's pray Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for all that you have done for us, not least in going to the cross to shed your blood for us. And Father, we drink this cup in thankfulness to you for sending your Son, because we know that it should be our blood spilt, not yeah. his. Yes. But Lord Jesus, you did it willingly, and as we read in the scriptures, you did it with joy set before you. So Father, Give us joy in Jesus' name as we drink and eat. Amen. 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 Yeah. <clears throat> well, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today for feeding us with the body and the blood of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give you thanks that we can join with many, many Christians around this world and in this village, in praising you for your goodness and mercy. Help us as we go out into the world to give glory to you in all that we do and say today. Amen. 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 Well, we're going to end with a lovely hymn, The Spirit Lives to Set Us Free. And whenever I hear this hymn, I often think of a, a dear, dear friend who's now in glory, uh, David, who uh, used to love to sing that hymn, so in memory of David.
Do forgive my voice, by the way, I'm struggling a bit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Thank you all for being here today. It's been lovely to have you with us. Do come back tonight at 6.30. <coughs> Our brother Stuart's going to be preaching tonight, so looking forward to hearing what Stuart has to say. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And I wonder how he could love me a sinner come down I stand amazed, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. In your presence, Lord. And I wonder how he could love me, a sinner. 